Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Attention ranchers, transform your land, livestock, and livelihood with Noble Research's regenerative management courses. Learn from their expert advisors and unlock proven strategies to enhance soil health, improve forage quality, reduce operation costs, and increase profitability. Through hands-on workshops, you'll gain skills to build a resilient and thriving ranch for generations to come. Space is limited. Visit noble.org today to explore their regenerative management courses and enroll. Invest today in your land, livestock, and and livelihood. That link is also in the show notes. Alrighty, folks, thank you for tuning in to another episode today. Today, we are going to be visiting with Kevin Lynch, and he's going to be talking about his experiences with grazing multiple species at one time on his operation. He has a lot of experience with a lot of different species. He's very passionate about soil health and grazing and is really a great resource to learn about what it takes to get started as well as just the benefits in general from deciding to raise multiple species and how to properly graze them and what challenges come from the beginning pro- beginning stages of implementing this. So with that, before we dive into the episode, I do want to remind you that if you are looking for a speaker for your next event in 2024 or even into 2025, I am booking those opportunities now, whether that is a key- keynote, a panel, or a workshop. I love to do all three. I'm even open to doing Zoom events as well. But with that, let's visit with Kevin. Well, Kevin, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join me for a conversation today about interspecies grazing and talk a little bit about how producers are implementing that onto their operations and what the benefits of that are. But before we dive into that topic itself, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you. So if you wouldn't mind sharing with those listening and myself, what is your background in agriculture and what are you doing today? Okay, my name is Kevin Lynch. I work at the Noble Research Institution in Ardmore, Oklahoma. Uh, My duties here, I work in the research service department. We do all the forage sampling soil sampling for our research. Uh, We do plant identification. Um, We do uh, monitoring uh, soil, different soil types, uh, different uh, range ecology stuff too here. Uh, I've been here for 17 years. Uh, Outstanding place to work. Uh, I also help on the ranches with the small remnants. Uh, We run uh, sheep and goats here on the the ranches here at Noble Foundation started that uh, three years ago and stuff. And as far as my background education, I graduated from Oklahoma State University with an ag ed degree and a minor in animal science. Uh, I have raised, uh, <clears throat> I have been raising small ruminants for 40 years. I started when I was 10 years old as a FFA, 4-H and FFA project. Really it was 4-H uh, since I was 10. Uh, and then I, I just had a passion for it. Uh, my grandpa was a small ruminant uh, producer, run cattle too, older buyer, uh, also for cattle and sheep and goats. Uh, then it stuck with me. Uh, I have a passion for ag. Uh, uh, I worked I worked with exotic animals for five years. I thought that would be interesting. I had an opportunity, and I did do that uh, for five years. I was animal manager at Arbuckle Wilderness Animal Park in Davis, Oklahoma, Uh, but I have always run cattle, sheep, and goats. Uh, I'm a little different than most people. I'm a little, I will try new things. Uh, I have, uh, I raise exotic animals, uh, raised buck and bulls for four years, uh, dabbled with that for a while. Uh, And as far as right now, Myself, I run cattle, used to run cattle, sold all my cattle. I'm strictly sheep and goat, man. Um, my boy started raising bison, and now I'm helping him with his bison herd. Uh, we run called Cross Timber Bison. Uh, he runs about 60 head of bison, and I have bison at my place, too. Uh, it's a little different with the sheep and goats and the bison uh, because the bison can have some disease they can pick up from the hair sheep. Uh, now the wool sheep are fine and goats most of the time are fine with the bison. 
but uh, this little sticky subject, sticky situation there. Uh, but it, it's it's been it's been interesting. Uh, I'm definitely a grazer type of person. I like for animals to produce on their forage. What draws you to the grazing side of it? You mentioned that you've uh, always it from what you just said. You've always been really passionate about raising animals, trying new things, but very much a theme of grazing animals in there. So what has drawn you to the grazing side of it, especially if you've had a career with Noble for 17 years? That's a long time. Yeah, well, I like the grazing side of it because of the, it lowers your inputs, for sure, if you if you manage your grazing properly. And also it's better for the ecology of the land and the soil than it, the proper grazing techniques are used and stuff. The longevity of the land will last longer for it you know, for future generations. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about what it's like to have multi-species grazing, where you're grazing multiple different species on one operations. How, you know, can you explain a little bit more about what multi-species grazing is on a deeper level? Mm, yes. Uh, it can be it can be really deep or it can be really simple in my opinion uh, multi grazing uh, different types of species cattle sheep and goats are probably the I mean that's the easiest to in uh, to implement uh, in my opinion uh, but also what I like about it is like like in our uh, central here central Oklahoma uh, you can run usually around here about one cow for about ten acres. Uh, but sheep and goats, you can run five sheep, five goats to an acre pretty easy. And then if you implement multiple species grazing, you can graze your cattle and your sheep at the same time, or uh, then you can have input. Your inputs will be better. Your soil fertility will be better, especially with sheep and goats than just running cattle. And also cattle is a little different than sheep and goats. Cattle uh, they like candy grass, and I, I call it candy grass. They find their favorite forage, and they stay on top of it, especially if you don't do a rotation system or adaptive grazing system. Uh, sheep and goats are variety grazers. They uh, change varieties all the time when they're grazing. So is it better to run them on the pasture at the same time or can you run like a herd of cattle and then bring in sheep after that what are other different options for uh, multi-species grazing well uh, yes yes you can do uh you can run them a combination sheep and goats and cattle together or you can run cattle then follow it up with sheep or goats or vice versa i mean there's either way uh personally um i like to run uh my sheep together with my cattle when I had cattle. I like that because to me, there was, there's no competition of the grazing style and stuff. And plus when you do that, you're putting stock in more numbers on your per acre than your cash flow at the end is better because you just get, because on the cattle, you get one calf a year, the sheep and goats, if you really want to, if you can do, you can do twice a year because it takes five months of gestation for them. Or if you want to get really in depth into it, you can get a three lamb crops every two years if you want to get in debt. But that's a little more, if you're a new person, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, but that's a person who's been around sheep and goats for a while. So what management challenges come when you're running two different species together? Mm, two different species. In my opinion, if you're just starting out your fences, is your your main concern fences and water uh, and stuff? Uh, if you're running sheep and cattle together, it's not too bad. It's pretty simple. You can, especially if you buy hair sheep, you can run single hot wire. Ninety nine, I say ninety eight percent of the time, you can keep the sheep in with a single hot wire. And cattle, you can. I mean, if you cattle trained hot wire, cattle are easy with single, but you just have to lower it for cattle. I mean, for the sheep, you have to lower it to about 16 inches off the ground. Uh, but now if you're running goats, it's a little more different. Goats, you can break to hot wire. Uh, I would recommend three hot wires for goats. Uh, and uh, uh, But the goats are just a little different creature, but they have a really 
I mean, they bring a good side to the grazing component because if you have if you have woody species, goats like woody species. They will in the dormant season they will go back to eating grass during the dormant season. But in the spring, all summer, woody if you have a lot of encroachment of wood, woody species, goats would be a good option. So you mentioned goats would be a good option for woody species, especially during the mm -hmm. growing season. Um and but you like sheep with cattle because there can be less competition otherwise. How like how do producers determine which species is best for them? You know, or maybe a better way to think about that is what are the goals of producers who are grazing multiple species? Why are people deciding to put multiple species together for their grazing strategies? I, I mean, I would say most of the people in our neck of the woods uh, went to multi-grazing systems, uh, multi-species grazing system because of the, it also versifies their income. And also they're really concerned about the land and the soil and the forage. And I mean, that's my personal opinion of it. Uh, because right now there's a big, big passion for, uh, to try to save our rangelands, uh, improve our forage and stuff because the sheep and goats will give you another enterprise. They will cost you a little money up front, uh, especially uh, on your fences and your waters. But as a whole, if you, if you stay with it, uh, I mean, your inputs will definitely decrease because if you run sheep and goats, in my opinion, uh, I can just tell you for a fact, uh, on my place, I hadn't sprayed in 30, see, there'd be 38 years I haven't sprayed. And I run sheep and goats. Wow. And and that's, I mean, I mean, yes, I may have to spray like a Russian thistle every once in a while, like spot spray. I mean, that's a different story. I mean, they will eat them, but they won't just eradicate them, you know. Uh, but as far as anything else, I mean, I still have, I still have uh, wildflowers in the spring come up, even running sheep and goats every year. Uh, my weed suppression is way low because the sheep and goats will eat weeds uh, and at, at different stages. When they first come up, they'll graze them. When they get a fourth, uh, when, when they get about 12, 14 inches tall, and they're grazing something else, and then they'll come back to it. And just because of the plant, the way the plant's made up and stuff. But it's, uh, but you can definitely lower your inputs for sheep and goats in the long haul. So you mentioned earlier that with, was it your bison and mm -hmm. certain breeds of sheep, there can be disease or animal mm -hmm. health concerns that you need to be aware of. Is yes. that the same when you're mixing beef cattle with other livestock species? Uh, you talking about sheep and goats? Yeah, is there any, are there any animal health no. concerns that producers need to be aware of when mixing species? That's, no, no, ma'am, not that I'm aware of uh, in my lifetime. Uh, the only one you have a problem with is bison and hair sheep. Okay. Grazing together, yes. Mm -hmm. That is correct. So is this multi-species grazing something that you've seen being effective across multiple climates, or is it better in certain areas of the United States? These, my listeners come from all 50 states and a few other countries. So I guess what have, what's the research shown on how effective that can be? I don't, I mean, I had, I mean, I've seen a little bit of research done on it in different climates, but I would recommend if you, like if you're in a, wet, uh, a really wet climate, I would recommend there's also species of uh, sheep or goats that work better in that area. And that's one thing you should do if you're thinking about switching over to sheep and goats is you need to do some homework, some background. Uh, I would recommend you need to contact somebody or there's some places you can look up. But on the sheep and goats side, of course, the climate, man, I'm telling you, a sheep, can, a sheep and goat can survive in the desert, the wet areas, especially the hair sheep. The hair sheep are really good. Now, wool sheep, there's nothing wrong with the wool sheep. But you do, they look more labor intensive. You do have to shear them. Uh, but they are a little more touchy to the climate than the hair sheep. The hair sheep can range from all the way from really wet, arid countries and survive here in central Oklahoma. 
just fine. I mean, even in Nebraska, I mean, there's a lot of sheep in Nebraska. A lot of people don't think there is, but there is. So what about the mineral component for producers who are putting mineral or supplements out for their cattle, um, mm -hmm. where you have different species who maybe shouldn't be having those same minerals? How do you manage yes. that? Okay, uh, as far as cattle, if you run hair sheep in cattle, you you probably won't have any problem. Hair sheep can take copper, uh, and goats and can take more copper than wool sheep. Now, if you run wool sheep, you have to watch the mineral intake Europe because uh, wool sheep cannot take copper. It will shut down their liver and stuff. Now, as far as uh, the the goats in the in the in the uh, hair sheep, I mean, they're fine with the cattle mineral. I wouldn't, I wouldn't just say don't buy any sheep and goat mineral. But once again, I'm going to go back to say if you're grazing properly, in my opinion, and what I have seen over the years, if you have a proper grazing management system, yes, you have to supplement sometimes like on the sheep and goats. I would recommend supplement during breeding season, then late, then about middle gestation with, you know, with some added mineral. But if you're grazing properly, your forage will have all, all the mineral they need. Is that going to be true, though, for people who are just starting with this and still trying to kind of improve their soil health and forage quality? Uh, well, I mean, it won't be when they, when they first started. Yes, they still have to have some mineral. But when you first started implementing multi-species, you'd be surprised how much your forage will and forage uh, quality will increase. I mean, it, I mean, it will definitely increase because uh, I will recommend, like I'm, like where we live, I have native grasses mainly. I'm a native grass guy. I mean, yes, there is monoculture, you know, like Bermuda grass and different stuff, coastal and stuff. But sheep can survive off that, and goats can do the, I mean, survive off monoculture. But if you graze properly. Uh, you, you, I mean, you'll be surprised once you stop spraying your monocultures, the, the, the forbs will start coming up and your sheep and goats can graze it and they'll gain off that just like they do grass. I mean, the same principle, they're a little different. Some cattle can gain off forbs, but sheep and goats will gain off forbs just like they do grass. The Red Angus breed continues to grow in numbers and influence. Why? It's because of the quality cattle and the hardworking folks who produce them. Red Angus females are known as the beef industry's most favored female and have dominated the market for more than a decade. According to Superior Livestock data, Red Angus heifers command a $92 premium per head compared to all other breeds. The longevity, efficiency, and calm disposition of Red Angus females make them the ideal cow for today's producer. To explore opportunities through the Red Angus breed, visit redangus.org. So you mentioned that this is kind of a long game in the term of like mm -hmm. your ROI. How long is it before producers can start seeing differences and changes, whether that's in um, forage quality or um, soil health in general? Like when, when can people start noticing some of those changes? Well, <clears throat> you saw health, it will take longer for sure. Uh, and because you can do a, a soil test, uh, and I recommend do the Haney test if you're going to do a soil test, do the Haney test, uh, because that test breaks it all down. It does, it breaks it down really well. Uh, and also, it does carbon too. There it does microbes because you need all that in your soil. Uh, I would say, as far as the soil, it's going to take a while. I can't really tell you that. I uh, mean, how many years for sure for setting stone? But we're doing research here at work for that right now. Uh, we are. Uh, now, the forage on the forest, the forest side of it, uh, you should be able to tell the difference when you're running sheep and goats in with another multi species like cattle or something like that. Or you can run them with horses. I mean, you can. You horses just got to get used to it. I mean, used to your sheep and goats. Same way the cattle. The cattle never been around one. You need to introduce them slowly. Uh, and stuff, but I'd say on the forage, I can see on the places that I that we have started our new places. I'd say in forage in two years, I can see the difference in forage. 
Okay. And, and to and visual see it. And I mean, which I know, you know, different types of plants. I have to do that, you know, identify plants, but I mean, you can really see the difference. So for producers who are considering this, what mm -hmm. questions do they need to be asking themselves to make sure that this is the right thing to implement with their grazing plan? Okay. Uh, if you're thinking about it, uh, I definitely would do my homework and I would talk to somebody that is definitely a sheep and goat guy or lady in person uh, or visit with them over the phone or email back and forth. Uh, your uh <clears throat> and get some background information sheep or the hair sheep and goats uh especially there's about four or five breeds of goats that are really hardy uh hair sheep breeds there's several of those there's about really there's about 10 that you can get pretty easy uh i mean th that are really hardy low maintenance uh kind of like the cow herd really uh a lot of people want to pump a lot of people want to do a lot of hands-on uh, I'm more of a, especially on my commercial herd, I just want them to graze. I want them to breed them twice a year. If I do that, then sometimes I breed once a year for spring lambs or spring or spring uh, kids. And, uh, but for is information, I definitely would talk to somebody that has sheep and goats. And in my area, I definitely would try to, if you are definitely going to buy some, buy from some person that's raising them and has the same grazing system that you have uh you know because it definitely makes a difference you know uh especially in the sheep and goats because a lot of people dry a lot stuff anymore and stuff but i mean mine are grazing every day i mean they're out grazing i mean yes i pin some of them up at night some of them i don't i have dogs running with them you know it's a different story uh but do that and also the next thing you have to think about is how big a place you have uh your fences and your water systems that's to me that's the two kids two biggest problems you have when you switch over to the sheep and goats is your fencing and your water system you talked about the fencing earlier but mm -hmm. what about the water system what do producers sometimes have to change there if they're traditionally just running cattle and do mm -hmm. add in sheep or goats. What are they having to change with their water systems? Okay, uh, you have to have a water, a smaller water trough. They don't drink a lot of water. Sheep and goats don't. About oh, maybe a gallon and a half a day at the month. That's it. I mean, if you if it's springtime, early spring, good summer, it hadn't you've been getting some rains. I mean. It's pretty simple. You just need a lower trough. Uh, if you have if you have big uh, tanks, uh, for as uh, a water trough of metal or polyplastic or fiberglass, you just have to add a uh, rock around it to raise it up uh, for them to drink out of because they're a lot shorter than cattle and the uh, uh, and the horses. Uh, or you can have a separate water system if you want to just have one for them uh, set up. You can do a portable water system. It's not the, it's not that, I mean, really you can do that pretty easy. If you run, say you run, say you run in 40, 40 head of nannies and 40 head of ewes together with your cattle, uh, you can water them out of a, a rubber make water trough and a gravity flow, flow, mm -hmm. no problem. I mean, especially if you, especially if you put a little fence around it or put a creep gate on it in front and keep the cattle out of it, I mean, I mean, you can do it pretty simple. All right. Kevin, do you have any resources that you'd like to share if people want to learn more about this after they're done listening today? Uh, if if you special on sheep and goats, I would recommend to study your uh, the breeds of uh, hair sheep. I recommend hair sheep uh, for people. There's nothing wrong with wool sheep. I have wool sheep. I do. I run them. Uh, but then a little more time consuming and higher maintenance. Uh, I would say learn the the breeds of sheep that are working in your area. Uh, the best breeds as far as I mean, there's certain breeds for milking. There's breeds for carcass, for carcass. Same way that uh the goats and really in the goats, there's about I recommend Spanish, 
on the goat side, I recommend Spanish, Kinko, Savannah, Texas Master. Uh, the Spotted Boar is not bad for an outcross. Uh, it's not bad at all. Uh, but that's that's the goats that I would recommend for somebody on a grazing system, uh, especially if they have a pretty big operation. Now, if it's small acreage, I mean, I would. Uh, I mean, you can run about anything as far as goat wise. I kind of stay away from the straight boar goats, the 100% boar goats, because we have, there's nothing wrong with the boar goats. I mean, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but we have weakened their ability since they've been introduced to Oklahoma in the United States because uh, we are starting to dry a lot of them. Everybody's showing them now, and they took all that vigor out of them and stuff. But there's other species now. On the, as far as the hair sheep, there's whites, there's cantatas, dorpers. Uh, there's St. Coors. Um, I mean, there's several. Uh, Black Belly Barbado is a been around for a long time. It's not the best meat. It's not the best carcass or meat sheep they're out there. But uh, you can cross them with a, a white or a, a, a dorper, and it really makes a really good uh, carcass lamb and stuff. But I mean, I just was studying my breeds. Uh, then there's a couple of uh, goat ranchers, a really good magazine really good magazine uh i would recommend you know you can pull that up on your computer and look at it and stuff uh then uh premier livestock uh company is uh they carry a lot of sheep and goat stuff um uh, supplies knickknacks stuff that you need to use on your operation uh really uh if that's a, uh if, because as far as sheep and goats, really, you know, everybody gets worried about, you know, like medicine, antibiotic, warmer. But all the stuff that I named off of the breeds of the sheep and goats that I named off, they're pretty low maintenance. They're parasite, parasites resistance, the goats are and the sheep are. Uh, and if you have a good grazing system, you run them properly, you, sometimes you get by without worming them at all, sometimes maybe once a year. Uh, and some people just try, and there are some people that are breeding sheep and goats, they don't worm at all. I mean, that's just their cr criteria. If something happens, they'll sell, you know, they'll ship them, and they'll just keep breeding and stuff because they want, uh, you know, low-maintenance sheep and goats. Uh, but there's several ranches that you can buy from uh, on sheep and goats, but I would recommend to buy off of, off of somebody that is uh, that has a business. Just don't buy, you know, just don't buy it. Don't go to the sale barn and buy sheep and goats for your place. All right. Well, Kevin, I will share the link to Noble in the show notes. And I really appreciate you taking time and sharing your knowledge and personal experiences with my listeners today. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? No, nope, that's it. Unless you feel like there's something else we missed or that's important to talk about, but we talked about. No, I, I just would say if you really want to try, if you're a cattleman and you really are, are a lady, uh, you really want to try sheep and goats or small ruminants, I would say try. It's, it's really beneficial to you. It's beneficial to your ranch. Uh, they have lots of pluses. Yes, they have some minuses. Uh, but the market is still market still good, and now it's not good as cattle business right now, by no means. Uh, but it's still good. Uh, the inputs are really considerably low on them, especially if you already have cattle. You can run them together, uh, and you can definitely have another enterprise. Uh, and if you want to think outside the box, I mean, there's lots of other things you can do too uh with your sheep and goats uh i mean it's but it's definitely worth i mean there's definitely a, a avenue there for people to have another income and another enterprise to make you money to offset your ranch and also to help you out you know in the long run all right well i appreciate those final remarks and you have a good rest of your day all right you too thank you all righty folks 
If you want more information about the Noble Research Institute, about grazing multiple different species, that link is down in my show notes, as well as a few other great resources for you all. Thank you again to our sponsors for bringing this episode to us. Their information is also in the show notes. With that, remember to keep an open mind and be curious about how you can improve your operation and have a great day. Happy ranching, folks.